Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to put your headphones in, you'll be able to follow along to this terrific panel session. My name is Simon Breakspear. I'm based in Australia, and I'll be your moderator today as we explore how do we unlearn how teachers learn. Can you hear me through the headphones? You have to put the headphones in. So, collectively, we are deeply committed to impacting student learning, and we spend much of our time across the WISE Summit thinking about the changes that we want to see for students. But if we're going to have those changes for students, then we equally need to talk about not just student learning, but the teacher learning that will be required to enhance teacher expertise in order to have the impact we want them to have. Indeed, we need teachers who know their content and how to teach it. They know their students and how they learn. And teachers who can adapt evidence-informed practices to meet the unique context of their classroom. And so therefore, our schools need to not just be great institutions of student learning, but adult learning as well. Over the last 10 years, we've seen big changes in how teachers get to learn together. A shift towards more embedded school learning based on the best available evidence, working collaboratively together. And today, served by four contributors on this panel, we're going to be exploring how we might need to unlearn how teachers learn and to look to new innovations that could help us all accelerate the work that we do. It's now my pleasure to invite up our four panelists for the discussion. Do you want to please come and take your seats and feel free to give them a round of applause as they come on up and settle in. Well, good morning and thank you for being here. We're thrilled, really, to have an opportunity to listen in on a discussion that's about to happen from four exceptional leaders in the field, representing three countries, Qatar, India, and the Netherlands. And everyone on this stage has also been a practicing teacher at some point, and Daisy, you yourself continue to do so. What I'd like to do is to give each of you a brief opportunity to tell us a little bit about your work. But in brief introduction, we have Dr. Asma, who is the head of research here for WISE. Also from Qatar, we have Buthena, uh, the president of pre-university education for the Qatar Foundation. Ovashi, representing the work she's leading at a very large scale in India at the Study Hall Education Foundation, and Daisy, a teacher, and indeed one of the top 10 teachers of the world in 2019. So why don't you each tell us a little bit about your work, and then we'll delve into the topic today. Dr. Asma? Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Asma Al-Fadala, Director of Research here at WISE. Um, I started my career as a teacher, a policy analyst, a researcher, and I did my uh, postgraduate and uh, educational reform and school leadership improvement. Uh, I joined WISE five years ago uh, as a director of research, but I also work with local schools, either from the Ministry of Education or from QF schools, uh, to build their capacity and uh, helping school leaders lead not only students' learning, but also uh, teachers' learning, which we will define it, I think, later on. Dr. Asma, thank, thank you for you. being here. Urvashi, tell us a little bit about your incredible work. I'm Urvashi Sani from India, Lucknow, North India. Thank you very much for having me here. I started a school in 1986 in my garage with six children. And now, today, 34 years later, we are serving 5,000 directly and over a million indirectly. So our work is basically focused on redefining the scope of education so that we include lessons of equality and more specifically gender equality and social justice along with lessons of math, science, history, geography, etc. And we have trained in the course of our work thousands and hundreds of thousands of teachers and continue to do so both face to face and digitally and I'll talk more about that later. Well, we look forward to learning the lessons so far. 
Now, Daisy, many of us, when asked about our favorite primary school teachers, often have a name that come to mind, and we might say they're the best teacher. Uh, but you in 2016 technically were voted the best primary teacher in the Netherlands. It's wonderful to have a practicing teacher's perspective here. Tell us a little bit about your school context and your work. First of all, I'm really happy to represent teachers in the summit. Um, I'm teaching in a very, yeah, I, I always call it like a ghetto in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, we, in our school, we have up to 30 nationalities, mm -hmm. so that's quite large. And um, I teach in an elementary school in grade 5 and 6, and I do that three days a week. And uh, on Monday, Monday, I work in The Hague together with the Princess of the Netherlands uh, for Number 5 Foundation. And what our dream is, what my dream is, that child participation, child emancipation in schools, so that children take ownership of their own, le own learning process uh, is the new norm in every school. So Wonderful to have you here. And Buthena, uh, a local here leading pre-university education for Qatar, Qatar Foundation. Tell us a little bit about what that involves and the schools and this, the organizations you oversee. Uh, so in my uh, position as the president of pre-university education, I lead uh, 12 schools under the umbrella of QF and the Education Development Institute, which is dedicated to the continuous professional learning for teachers. Fantastic. Well, we'll be able to draw on that experience both in 12 schools and also trying to uh, develop a, a, an organization of professional learning that serves all Qatari teachers. Well, Dr. Asmar, I might turn to you first as we start to explore what are the elements of high quality teacher learning and indeed um, in what areas might we need to unlearn how teachers learn. So why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Simon. I think we need to redefine what do we mean by uh, learning and unlearning and what type of education we want to introduce in our schools. And the reason behind this, I think schools as organizations are complex, set, mm -hmm. has complex settings where when we introduce new ideas, new innovations, people may resist these new ideas. People, uh, it will involve uh, changing in their behavior. So we need to consider that element. Number two, the world around us is changing. Uh, with the advancement in technology, the connectivity, uh, massive disruption and innovation in housing, transportation, healthcare, and all of that uh, have impact on the type of education we want to introduce. So to summarize the three type of learning we want to introduce mm -hmm. is we want to encourage uh, the learning that informed by research, okay. driven by data, number one. Number two, provide the opportunity for uh, teachers to uh, challenge their current practices, their skills, their beliefs. And finally, to provide a disciplined discussion, collaborative teamwork that they can uh, debate and discuss what is relevant to their context and to their classrooms. Fantastic. Maybe I can talk later about examples from the work we do here. We're hearing Rice. a situation where teachers would be gathered together, informed by relevant research evidence that's contextually appropriate, engage in deep discussion and think about areas of practice they can take into our classroom. This is uh, a terrific synthesis, I think, Asma, of the international research. Well, Vashi, take us to what this can look like across serving 6,000 students, uh, training thousands of teachers. So uh, when we started our school, we really included the teachers in, as co-creators of the whole school policies, of their teaching practices, informed by theory, of course, but even those theories were sh deeply contested. So that as part of our whole school evolution was a program where all, every week the teachers mm -hmm. would meet along with me and we would think very deeply about our children, what they need, 
what how they learn what they want to learn and then how do we approach them in the classroom and we would reflect upon this continuously and for 34 years we have continued that practice so that we help our teachers think of themselves as co-creators mm. as creative intellectuals and as education experts with all the autonomy to be the queens of their mm. classrooms and respond to the children as they see contextually fit not just that the teachers because they have the autonomy they know that they have the freedom to fail mm. and because they have the freedom to fail they feel free to experiment and they feel free to contest the theoretical learnings that have come and in fact be knowledge producers and be teacher researchers mm. in their classroom mm. but most importantly they learn to respect themselves as teachers and as i've been interviewing many of the teachers especially for this panel they said that what they'd learned over the years was first of all to respect themselves as teachers and as intellectuals and that has fueled their work going forward so we see here a model of uh, not of uh, teachers sitting in rows receiving workshops from experts outside but indeed sitting around problems of practice that are emerging in the context of their classroom that you're giving the the mindset that the solutions are within them that they're going to move through uh, iterative cycles of action research thinking and working and the end result of that it sounds to me in your context is not just change knowledge and skills but this change identity you're saying uh, teacher as professional teacher as expert teacher as learning designer and, and as knowledge constructor oh i love that for so the constructor of their own knowledge building their own expertise in practice daisy you are in practice uh, each day working in an complex and demanding environment what does good teacher learning look like to you or what might we as a profession need to unlearn about the way we do teacher learning i really want to build on what is said before because um i when i uh, listened i i there popped up a lot of examples in my mind about my process as a teacher but because 12 years ago i wasn't that bad teacher of i wasn't that good teacher in my opinion um Uh, what I learned in teacher training college was lesson planning, mm. lesson planning, and lesson planning, and then and anything else, <laughs> lesson planning, reflection, <laughs> a kind on of reflection upon the lesson planning. Uh, upon the uh, lesson planning, yeah. And what I really, after that four years, it's four years in the Netherlands, I really felt like a robot. I didn't really had the chance to think myself and then you have like the methods for language and math and they really describe what you have to say and ask to the children. So it's strange that they think that you mm. don't have the ability to ask the questions yourself. So there's also the way people think about the teaching profession and then you have your own identity and in my opinion teaching le teachers learning is about a triangle and really build on what you said it's about identity so you know what your vision on education and my my vision is uh, relatedness competence and autonomy first okay so we've got a triangle here the first part is about this vision, vision. okay and then we the have the evidence based knowledge uh, i had the chance to do my masters in learning and innovating we have that chance in the netherlands right. you, after the teacher training college you have a masters degree of two years so i learned how to um adapt uh, evidence based things and in my teaching and i really had to know what works and then the third thing is collaborative learning with your colleagues when you work in an environment where, where there's not an environment of a learning of learning and making mistakes i don't think uh when you can make mistakes and when teachers are looking at your colleagues oh you did a bad instruction hmm. you're going to you want to do it better next time because you feel really really insecure yeah so that's the triangle vision evidence informed knowledge and then collaborative learning with your colleagues we find out um can i bring you in here and i know there's uh, a whole range of experiences you could draw on from your own time as an educator in schools uh trying to uh, and supporting 12 different schools but could i ask you here to think particularly about your work with EDI uh running a large scale professional learning organization what are you learning about the most effective approaches to teacher learning or where might we need to unlearn 
So EDI uh, has been established five years ago, and during that journey, it evolved from you know offering short courses to the most recent program that was launched, which is called Petal. It's a program for effective teaching and learning, which takes into account everything that my colleagues here hmm. talked about. So this is a concrete example of how we deliver professional learning today. At the heart of this program is teacher's agency. Hmm. So it is, we don't tell you what you need to do. We help you and coach you resolve the problem of practice that you have in the classroom. So it's a year-long program where the trainer becomes more of a mentor and a coach where we discuss situations and help you make decisions based on evidence in the classroom. Wow, terrific, of course. Of you know, I just want to pick on something that you said about uh, teachers feeling like robots. I think that's really an important thing that, uh, and with teacher agency, I think it's important and that's what we do in our organization that teachers should not feel only as a means to an end. Mm. That you are a means towards the children's learning and it doesn't matter, you don't matter as a person. It's very important for teachers to feel valued as persons themselves mm -hmm. and to feel that their growth and their learning is just as important, in fact more relevant to themselves as teachers. And when you give them the agency and the autonomy you build a culture around that, where that is the expectation or the demand of the organization that they in fact create, they think, they reflect, they self-critique and critique each other. And of course, make mistakes if they have to. I remember in uh, one of the teachers, she was new and she'd come into, my, into the office. And we were talking, you know, just as a review. So I asked her, I said, so how are you and are you happy? She burst into tears. I, I said, what happened? So she says, you know, in all my previous uh, employment, nobody has ever asked me if I was happy. Mm -hmm. They might have asked me if the children were performing well, but they never asked me if I was happy. And I think she valued that and she's been there for 20 years. In our 34 years, my first teacher is still there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's because wonderful. I think they, feast, they see this as a whole culture of care, care for themselves, for their students, and then they become more caring and they feel that they are being transformed and respected as much as the students are being transformed and respected. Wonderful. Yeah. If Dr. I Asma. may add here, I think what we are talking about is great, but we need that element which is the role of school leadership in supporting this type of learning. So uh, the evidence from research about the importance of school leadership in improving students' outcomes and um, teachers' learning is clear. Ten years ago, um, Vivian Robinson published her famous study, and we know all of that, but I think we need to shift the conversation from why this is important to the how. Mm. And uh, my colleague here, she mentioned part of it, which is the emotional support and mm -hmm. providing the support, but I want to add uh, providing time for collaborative learning, providing the resources, also uh, important, providing the opportunity to fail and fail well and learn from failure. I think that's all um, important. Creating a culture that is open uh, without fear from evaluation is also um, important. I want to reflect also on the discussion that happened in the plenary today and yesterday. Uh, so what's, what we are talking about here um, quality uh, teaching and uh, quality learning. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, important to the role of empowering people on the ground. Mm. The work of Vicky Colbert yesterday talked in the uh, closing uh, of the awards about her work in empowering uh, teachers. Today, Shakira talked about working with the people on the ground. So it's just to connect that we are aiming for system change system reform, but we need to work on the people on the ground, as Buthayna mentioned, teachers agency and empowering. Okay, them. so there's a, there's a couple of things here just, I just want to tease out and then uh, bring in, I'd, I'd love to bring you in Daisy to talk about what it looks like to be a teacher and be empowered, to, to have greater levels of agency. Um, so it sounds like there's a fair amount of agreement amongst you, even though representing very different organizations and contexts that teacher learning needs to be about teacher professionalism and expertise. 
that it's not about telling teachers to teach in a certain way, but to build their capacity to make perhaps the right decision on the best available evidence that's appropriate for their context. It seems increasingly that you're suggesting that teacher learning should look a lot more like collaborative knowledge building, solving problems of practice. Uh, but I'm hearing from you, uh, Dr. Asma, that this doesn't just emerge, that actually leadership is required to set up the time to provide structures and to change the culture of that school. So Daisy, can you take us to any specific examples at all about when there's times that you've felt safe to fail where you've been involved in some sort of teacher learning or a culture of learning that's allowed you to continue to improve your craft? First of all, I really want to mention my school leader never gives us the answer. Sometimes it's really annoying and we're like, okay, so you are the school leader, you have to decide. But then he, he turns it back to us. What do you think? You are the professional, you have the expertise. Okay. I don't. And for Are you sure he just doesn't know the answer? <laughs> No, but he's seeing it. I, I don't know. You know it better than me because I'm not in front of the class. I'm just your leader. And it's okay for me. Um, a practical example is um, every four years we have a new strategic plan. Okay. And my school leader isn't uh, making it himself. He involves us. He involves parents. He involves mm -hmm. children. And then we have three priorities this year. We have reading comprehension, math, social emotional learning. And, he, and then he asks us, who wants to be the coordinator from reading comprehension? And my colleague was saying, I want to do it. Okay, arrange a team around you, he said. She did. And now she is leading the whole reading comprehension development in our school. I do inclusive education. And he, Every time when I talk to him about what shall we do next with our teachers, he is saying, okay, what do you want to do next? It's not that he not say, saying anything, but he gives his, mm. we call it a point at the horizon. And then I know, okay, so yeah, we can go that way. And I feel really like an expert because then what I've learned in my master's in innovating, I really can apply in practice. Mm. So I don't did, did it because I, I gain more knowledge, but I can put it into practice. And I feel like so empowered. And then in the end of the day, he always saying, you can be proud of yourself. And otherwise you have to be proud. Oh, my school leader did it. Or when mm. we are making a mistake, we, we could say, oh, but you said that I had to do it. So in the end of the day, we can be proud of this ourselves and then we feel empowered. And I always say, when you give teachers auto autonomy, you feel what autonomy is and you can pass it through the children. Mm. If you want to give children autonomy, you need to feel and live it yourself as a teacher. Very powerful. You can't give away what you haven't experienced yourself. I'm also hearing for each of you that rather than seeing teacher learning as something that happens as training, that actually the learning happens by doing the improvement work. Of well, actually, you were talking about you know, designing curriculum and planning and thinking that the teacher expertise development happens by doing the work or actually being involved in school-wide improvement work. And so there's a bringing together what Professor Michael Fullan might call um, learning the work by doing the work rather than moving away and being trained. Ovish, I'll bring you in in one moment. I just want to make sure uh, here, Bethana, uh, do you want to uh, come in and bring any thoughts about the role of leadership in ensuring these forms of teacher learning are the ones that are being embedded in your schools? So we believe a professional learning should not be ad hoc or, mm. you know, it should be embedded in the school, you know, by design. So what we've done is we've re reconstructed our school calendar and school days to give these opportunities for collaborative learning. Mm. So once a week there is the early dismissal for students to give this opportunity for teachers to get all together and discuss you know, matters of practice. I think that just, just to build up, this is such an important point. We can't say to teachers, be empowered, drive your own learning, but not actually uh, live that out by restructuring the nature of the work day or week. So you've actually changed on a certain time when the children go home to carve out time for the teacher learning. 
Yes, and we also allocated, you know, professional learning days in the school calendar. Okay. So this year we have two, next year we're increasing that to three because we've experienced how successful that experience and how powerful that experience for, mm. for the teachers and administrators. So uh, other than that, you know, in addition to, to that, it's, it's important for the leadership to empower and give the opportunity for teachers to network with professionals. And this is okay. also something that we've done in, in pre-university education. So we have two important conferences. One of them is called the STEP, which is sharing teachers effective practices. And this is an mm. opportunity for all teachers from 12 schools to get together. So the beauty of this conference, it's by the teachers for the teachers, where they actually get together and share what they've learned, you know, from, from their experience in our school. So it's very relevant, it's very, you know, contextual, and it's very practical to take back to the schools to learn. The other conference is called iSTEM Ed, which focuses on STEM education. Mm -hmm. And it's also open not only for our teachers, but it's also for all STEM professionals nationally and regionally to get, to get together, learn. And what's interesting in that conference is we also invite students to participate. So you experience the learning not only from teachers' perspective, but also from the students' per perspective. So given all of that, just very briefly, Bethina, what are the things you'd encourage leaders or uh, professional learning providers out there to stop doing, which is perhaps another way of saying unlearn it. Uh, what are some of the things we should stop doing? I think we need to stop the general professional development. I think, you know, in this world, you know, where we're talking about personalized education for students, we need to think the same for teachers. So learning should be personalized. And, mm. you know, I think it's important to empower the teachers and they should have a choice and they should also, you know, um, contribute, you know, to the decision making of professional development. So what I would encourage, you know, all leaders to do is to have at least 50% representations in all professional learning decisions, you know, starting from the planning and designing, implementation and evaluation, their voice is very important. Fantastic. Ovashi, you've been very patient with me as I've brought in some other voices. Please uh, go ahead. And can I just uh, ask colleagues here, uh, the sound does go in and out a little bit, so um, as close as possible uh, to the chin would be terrific. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to what Asma mentioned earlier. You know, about um, teachers, you spoke about teachers on the ground. As I mentioned earlier, that we teach our teachers how to teach lessons of equality. Mm. And those are much harder to teach, really, than lessons of math and science. Because you have to, you're trying to change mindsets. You're trying to deliver, a, you're trying to get children to be philosophers, really, and change their practices, which are really part, they've been naturalized in their whole cultural uh, learnings. So with that, one we have to do, what we try to do is, the leadership has to do is change the teacher's role. They have to expand a teacher's role where they understand very clearly that what they do is very important social transformation work as well. Right? So in that, for example, with gender equality, mm. they need to understand, first of all, they have to deconstruct their own gendered perceptions of themselves, which we do during our training, understand what gender equality means. And secondly, understand that while they are helping girls understand that they are equal and understand their rights, they must learn to teach girls to be self-advocates and also learn how to be advocates for girls with the community mm. to be play that buffer. And what we found is that our teachers have gone, and not just our own school teachers, but teachers in remote schools, have gone the extra mile and learned to stop child marriages. Really, it's a very brave thing to do because mm. you have to go against the community. And I was surprised, and they said they would never have done this had they not been transformed to thinking of their role as people who should be helping girls stay in school and learn and try to counter some of the community barriers and the barriers on the wow. ground, the social barriers. So I think the leadership must understand the context, must understand what is what the children need, in this case the girls, and then help teachers look at their role differently, Fantastic. expand their idea of education and of their own role as teachers. That it's not just teaching them the math and science mm. more effectively, but helping these girls have better lives. In fact, we define education as being a way of helping students and teachers understand an answer to a question, which is who am I and how am I connected to the universe and others in it. But that's Very the powerful. main question. And history, English, math, science should all be 
play handmaiden to this main goal. And that's how you look at your own role and what you're doing with your children. Thank you. So, um, Avashi, you've been uh, an educational leader for decades now, building organisations that have been about teacher learning and teacher transformation. Um, Daisy, it sounds like you're in an organisation at the moment where your leader understands this view. But this is in some ways a, a new role for principals and senior teams. The idea that if you're a principal or a senior school leader, you actually need to be a leader of adult learning cultures and adult learning pedagogies. Dr. Asma, this is something that I know that you've been leading in multiple areas, both in your research studies here and also in programs. So let me ask you, um, we know that leadership is important to improving teacher learning. So how do we improve the leadership uh, so that we have more leaders who are building the types of organizations that are being described here? Well, to answer this question, maybe uh, I'll share um, the educational reform that uh, Qatar went through okay. as a case study and the role of um, school leaders in building that reform, engaging in that reform. Um, I published a book. It's available here uh, in the summit. Are we happy uh, to do book signings after this? Yes, Dr. after Asma? this there is and a book signing. what's the name sign. of the book? <laughs> So the name of the book, Qatari School Leadership Portrait, Lessons Learned from the Education and Reform. And I'm using portrait as a methodology um, uh, to, for uh, presenting the findings from uh, this research. And it's a methodology developed by uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot from Harvard uh, to present and share uh, uh, qualitative findings. So. I wrote four narratives, mm. four stories about um, schools in Qatar and the role of school leadership okay. um, in, in, in managing the challenges of the reform. So going back to your um, question, Simon, about how we develop school leadership, I think we need to think about the whole ecosystem where what can we provide for them so they can do their work better. Okay. Again, re referring to the work of uh, Vivian Robinson uh, about reducing change to increase improvement. Okay. And the idea of we need to think deeply about how we do less but better, either in teacher's training, sorry, I'm trying to avoid using teacher training, uh, so uh, to build their capacity uh, to be learners, to be designers, to be change makers uh, in improving students' outcomes. Terrific. Fantastic. Daisy, what about, can I ask, um, when often we use the term school leadership, people think of the principal, but uh, I know you're a huge advocate of teacher leadership and uh, I might say, distributed instructional leadership. Uh, what do you think, uh, what can we do to continue to build leadership capacity at all levels to um, have improved teacher learning? Yeah, what I think, I was listening to what you were saying, Dr. Asma. Um, I think it all starts with a really open-minded person as a school leader. Most of the time, school leaders want to push their vision through teachers in the classrooms. But it's really about knowing where you are going yes. and help teachers with the why so that they create their own vision and then a collaborative vision together. Okay. And so it really help, it's really helpful if you have a school leader that is really open and don't judge you by what you are doing, but really asking you open questions. Why did you do it? Mm -hmm. What was the impact of what you were doing? And then he can, it's also about let go, letting it go. And, and then, we'll then the teachers will take the responsibility and the ownership. If as a school leader, you, will, you take the ownership and the responsibility, nobody else is doing it. A little bit like the classroom, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, never work harder than your students. If you take all the Definitely. ownership and agency... They don't get an opportunity. Yeah, and we most of the time we talk about also in policy making, we have to have a bottom up approach. Mm -hmm. But most of the time it's still top down. But if you want to really start with a bottom up approach, you have to listen to first of all the children, because they are it's really strange to say the bottom, but in this theory, they are they are the owners of the a learning. Power dynamic, they yeah, are. yeah. Yeah. They are the 
owners of the learning process. Mm -hmm. So we have to start with their ideas. Mm -hmm. And when children say something to you and give my principal or my colleagues or I feedback, we are so like, okay, you will, it's different than where, when an adult is giving me feedback cool. because they have all the judgment in the back of their mind. Okay. So we've been speaking a fair amount um, in broad terms, empowerment, agency, culture, school leadership. I'm wondering whether we can actually go right down to the granular level of what would teachers actually be doing together in the specifics to uh, engage in this type of professional learning. I know there's a range of models that are operating in different parts of the world when we think about evidence-informed, personalised, empowering professional learning. But I want to try to get to concrete examples of what it's looking like. So, Bethany, if it's okay, I wouldn't mind picking up on what I think you described as the PETAL. Did I get that right? The PETAL program. Could you just, you know, briefly get right down to the teacher learning design for me? And I'd love to hear from others of their actual models, whether they have a name or not, to get a sense of what are actually teachers doing? Because allocating time or just saying that we want teachers to be empowered is a good start, but what are the actual structures and processes, I suppose, that will enable an embedded routine of professional growth? So do you want to uh, kick us off, Buthena, and then others, just briefly, some practical models you've seen work? So in this program, it's, uh, it really focuses on, you know, teachers' own motivation. So, you know, they, it's a teacher who applied to join the program. So it was okay. not, you know, from the management deciding, you know, you know X and Y would go. So it's a like choice a, opt it's in choice as a core of the principle. teacher. Yes. Uh, they also choose, you know, you know, what areas that they're going to be working on. Okay. and how they're going to tackle these. And there are different modalities of learning. So there is the component of, you know, face-to-face. -face, okay. And there is the component of... And what would they do in the face-to-face? So this is when they actually have conversations, meaningful conversations about the problems of practice. Okay. And here the trainer is a more of a coach where they actually nudge mm. them towards, you know, what could possibly be the answer. So they don't tell them what the answer is. Very similar to what Daisy is saying. This seems to be a common approach of people who don't know the answer. <laughs> Just keep asking the teacher. So, uh, but problem definition. Problem definition. How problem to, framing, yes. And, you know, then the data, how you could, you know, gather the data, mm -hmm. analyze it. What does it mean? How do you know that this works in this context yes. or it doesn't yes. work? And, mm. you know, and there is also a portfolio. So, you know, it's, it's a year longer process where they have actually go through the journey. And I think it's a very transformational journey. Well, because again, we're hearing this word come up, Uvashi. And this is, is it's a very similar to the inquiry based approach that we talked about. And we use it actually in the students learning. So, you know, we've taken it up to the professional and the adults learning as well. Okay. So just to pull out some design components here, longitudinal, not one offs. Uh, work put into problem definition at the beginning, that the problem is emerging from the context of the teacher's work, but coaching and support to make sure they're framing that problem in a way that uh, I suppose they can gain some traction on. And then longitudinally trying to solve that problem with support, coaching, and embedded work. Okay. Um, other brief examples of uh, things that you're doing and try to draw out the the principles, not just the principles, that the pragmatics. Um, Dr. Asmin, do you yeah. want to come in then? Obviously, I'll, yeah, I'll bring a quick your examples. question with um, empowering leaders of learning that we um, have designed, implemented in the last four or five years. Okay, so that's a with, program with, here? Yes, with support of you, Simon. That was but, not a setup, Dr. <laughs> Asma. Um, so I just want to um, uh, highlight the method we use okay. uh, to uh, advance uh, teachers' learning which is what we call it the impact cycle or the sprint where we encourage uh, teachers and school leaders to define, clarify the area that they want, which you um, explained it as a vision, what they want to achieve. Number two, we uh, provide the opportunity for them to incubate, to mm. test these models in their context, in their classroom. And finally, the amplification or the scaling up. And uh, uh, as you have been doing this, uh, Simon, uh, in several countries, um, the sprint model. So that's empowering teachers, involving in uh, students' learning that allow them to um, uh, challenge their current practices, but define and identify what's best for them, 
when and how? I think I appreciate you raising it. And I think one of the things that we've been learning together is whilst we definitely believe in a longitudinal journey, that within that journey it's helpful to have small bursts of thinking, action and reflection that build up to the change. And we've used the concept of a teaching sprint, people preparing and doing some thinking around problems and practice informed by research, moving into some doing over about one to four weeks of intensive deliberate practice in their context, and then reflecting on evidence and those small incremental things adding up to expertise change. Uh, let's hear from uh, Ovashi. What does this look like uh, across your schools in your teacher training? What are the actual practical approaches? The practical approaches are... Uh, much, I want to even talk about how we develop leaders in how, oh. what are the methodologies that we use for that. But for the teachers, we have a couple approaches. One, it is structured into our school calendar, as you mentioned. And in fact, it's much more frequent than three a year. It's almost one a month. Okay. And what it does is that you come and discuss your problems. You also show examples. You actually have a presentation. Mm. You'll come mm. and model it, that this is what I did, this is what happened, and this is the presentation, this is the lesson plan that I executed, which was, and this is what the outcomes of it were. We also video those, and what happens with these videos is two things. Mm. One is that we can get new teachers to watch the videos and okay. critique them. And secondly, we put them all online and we have about 2,000 videos, wow. which are now viewed by over a million viewers from uh, India, all across India. And then the government has taken them up because we all know that you learn best by watching good teachers as well, yeah. right? And so Where could people find those if they were interested? On a platform called DSH Online, they're all in Hindi. I might warn you, spoiler alert, but, but they are all in Hindi. So our Hindi-speaking neighbors from Nepal and Pakistan Fantastic. have been viewing them as well. And it's very empowering for the teachers, mind you, because a good teacher wants to teach not just 30 children in her class, but the teachers of the world. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. some of our teachers have had over a million views and they are over the top and bursting to do more. That is wonderful. That is true. And with, our, uh, uh, with the leadership team, uh, we have a huge leader, now 15 new leaders, you know, who are leading all our, uh, we have multiple schools and programs. What we do with them is that once a year we go away for a leadership retreat mm -hmm. where it's really transformational. Some of people have called it a spiritual experience where they come with problems that they want to address. They do a lot of reading, they present. And we have a lot of self-work that we do through the three, four days. And now what is happening with that is then they come and they use the same methodologies with their teams. Oh, and we okay. meet regularly at least three times a year to do follow-up with those leadership. This leaders. is a really important point. So you've, you've made earlier that teachers need transformational experiences and a methodology of inquiring their way into knowledge building if they're going to give it to students and now you're saying if leaders are going to be high quality leaders of teacher learning they them see, themselves had need to to actually experience that in their own life and in their own learning and i cannot emphasize enough the importance of personal transformation the teachers must not be treated as only a means to an end that they must you know your german philosopher said can't treat humanity always as an end in itself and never as a means alone. Yes. And so with people and with teachers particularly, often they end up feeling that they are just meant for the children. Yes, of course they are, but they are meant for themselves too. Powerful. And so it's Powerful. very, very important that teachers feel important as persons, addressed as persons, responded to as persons, and it's important that their own growth is as important, and not just as teachers, personal growth. So that's why leaders must build a culture of learning. We are 34 years old and I still think of ourselves 34 as years, a start, yeah. start up yeah. because we are a learning organization. Yeah. So we are not just a teaching organization. Most importantly, primarily, we are a learning you know, organization. You know, obviously, I, I can't help but think that um, there's probably no system in the world or school that doesn't use some of this language. Uh, we, we, we trust this, the teaching profession. We want to uh, uh, raise up their expertise. We want to support them. But it's probably not until you actually go and study how they've set up their cultures and processes of professional learning uh, only then, when you look at those, do you know whether it's just rhetoric about these or whether they truly do treat educators as knowledge-building uh, professionals who are given the time and the culture to improve their own craft. 
And I think sometimes there's a disconnect because many people are using the language, but what you've done over 34 years now is actually built organizations that represent those values and approaches in the way that they run. Uh, Daisy. <laughs> to build on that, uh, what I saw this morning in an email, a newsletter from the Ministry of Education, mm. all the policymakers there uh, went into the classroom and they did like an internship for one day together with the teachers. So I was, I was so happy to see because... So it wasn't the teachers going to miss, the ministry came yeah, to the schools. Yeah, they came. Terrific. Yeah, they had to apply to, at the schools to be there for one day. Mm. And what you said, you have to feel it. You have to feel the energy, the magic, and everything. The, yeah, what's happening in the classroom, because it is magic. And you can, I think what you said is really rationally. People think about it rationally, but teaching is also a emo really emotional job, and it has to be in balance. And hmm. people from outside, they most of the time, they think about it as like a theory. Yeah. Yeah. And another another uh, example, what I had to think about really empowered me, not only my school leader, but um, I had the chance to apply for a teacher development fund. Okay. It's a national fund for teachers. And um, I um, really wanted to do some research about giving effective feedback uh, during extended instruction okay. in math. And then I could apply for... Uh, for it and I got like 40,000 euros and it really gave me time two days a week to do research in my own context in my wow. school and and I there was some time for my colleagues which I I could involve them in my research team and they did the surveys of the children not me so then you spread the skills also the oh. research skills so that, so that really helped our team in yeah, doing research, and that's also really empowering that you know how to research or have the inquiry-based attitude. Fantastic. So again, similar elements, but this time very well funded from the ministry to actually step in and do that research practitioner work. So how do we scale up these approaches? Um, there's been a disappointing amount of agreement, actually. I was hoping for a little bit less, let me build on this, and more a little, let's disagree. Um, but considering we seem to have agreement about the direction, um, Daisy, you were talking about school leaders needing to see the horizon. I think you've all painted a really compelling picture of the horizon of teacher learning. So how do we ensure that most teachers, if not all teachers, uh, getting more experiences that align with what you're describing. How do we get to systemic change? What's the role of policy? What's the role of bottom-up? What's the role of an institute like EDI? So, Buthena, any thoughts about how we can have more teachers experience the type of professional learning that we're describing here? So I think professional learning communities are a very powerful tool. So mm. I think it's important to spread the awareness how effective. And this is how you start a movement from the, from the bottom up. Okay. Know, towards that. And at the same time, you know, working with, you know, policy makers on, you know, and uh, decision makers on supporting in creating an environment that supports this kind of interaction. So like I mentioned before is, you know, hearing the teacher's voice or like build, you know, design it uh, by design it's embedded in the school structure yeah, so i okay. think that would be very very powerful okay. otherwise if the ideas are not there and the structures are not there to support it it will not be sustainable really powerful so engaging particularly with policy leaders the investment in professional learning structured time not one-offs not short term but investing in teaching as a knowledge profession dr asma what are your thoughts about the role of policy makers how do we get towards an enabling system for this type of teacher learning at scale yeah well i think we we covered in this discussion most of the points uh, especially how to invest where to invest when to invest especially in um, teachers learning to avoid one-off courses and looking for long-term uh, learning. So that's something that policymakers need to unlearn. To unlearn, no more to one avoid one-off courses. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and looking at learning that um, driven by research. Looking at what type of approach that help teachers um, do and uh, practice in their in their context. So 
policymakers definitely they have an important role in supporting this whole uh, learning. Thank you very much. So briefly, uh, any other comments? And then we're going to move to the floor. So you are on notice. Uh, we're going to take questions, but also I'm happy to take very brief comments. We probably don't have time for a long preamble of your context, but any brief comments or examples of rich teacher learning that are emerging in your context? You know, uh, I think for policymakers, and that was the P word, the hard word, but I think what's important is you mentioned evidence earlier. You know, many of us, because we are running our organizations and we have, we have demonstrated success in student learning, in teacher learning, in teacher development and in leadership development, I think this is evidence that we must submit to policymakers and lobby really as educators for more policy change in our professional mm. development institutions, in the ways in which schools are set up and structured and their processes and operations. And so it needs for our voices, again you mentioned the bottom-up approach, it needs for our voices from the ground, where we provide evidence, you mm. know, that here is evidence that it works. So why shouldn't we be doing it? And why shouldn't it be part of policy? I think that's what we need. And each of you and have collective. been building those case studies. Right. So. those examples of what's possible. Yeah. Uh, Daisy, yeah. any last comments before we hear that, the room? Um, yeah, mo most of the cases, the policymakers are making the decisions and they decide what is on the agenda and also the cabinet or the government. But I'm like, okay, why are you not listening to the field, the, the people are doing the work. So, so why is that? Let me, because people will say that all the time. Ooh. Why aren't they listening to you? Why aren't they listening to us? It's really tricky to say it, but I think people always, they talk about highly educational experts. They are the highly educational experts. But I'm like, okay, and where are the teachers? Yeah, you told me you were at an event <laughs> recently and you were told you were sitting with high-level high experts Educational, uh, expert, educational yeah. experts and you but there no, weren't any teachers there no and I don't know what they think or how they feel maybe they really want to help sure. the profession but I think the agenda has to be uh, the, the teachers has have to decide the agenda and the children too the school context and then from the bottom up you create an like a policy okay agenda. all right I need to go to the room here so uh, I think a microphone will be brought to you. Uh, just raise your hand uh, and keep these comments to uh, 20 to 30 seconds. So uh, here we have one in the back and we have, how many microphones do we have? Uh, two. Okay. So let's uh, come up the front here and then there's one at the back there. If we can move a microphone, I'll come over. Those behind me, don't worry. I know you're there and I'm coming to you. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for this brilliant panel. Uh, my name is Masa Mufti. I'm an educator from Syria, and I happen to be working on a program. It's in detailed design phase, which is Refugee Teacher Academy, which is specifically uh, tends and works towards empowering uh, teachers working in context of crisis and conflict. Wonderful. And one comment I would like to add to everything you said that is absolutely um, relevant and brilliant is that teachers... In, in, cont in such context go through another layer of experience, almost a spiritual experience or transformational experience. This is the moment they feel so much valued. They feel that they are the hope agents. They are the ones, they are living a historical moment and it's so unfortunate that it, when it comes to response to humanitarian crisis, the people who are mostly marginalized are the teachers. Mm. So we tend to focus on beneficiaries, on teacher, on, yeah. on children's enrollment in schools and responses. And we forget the key player who is the teacher who is ready at this historical moment to become the leader. He's like the disposition is there. So I also based on evidence, we realize from my NGO that we, I work with Syrian refugees in Lebanon. This is why this training program of professional development started to become more of an academy Thank to be much. but my question this is something that i just wanted to add sorry but my question to you seems like we couldn't be more agreeing of what everything you said my question is how can we though unlearn how policy makers learn 
I think this should be the question. And all not, right, we need we, to redo this panel. That's a much better question. <laughs> Well, look, uh, on behalf of all of us, can we thank you for your work? Thank you for sharing in too much time a brief insight into that. And I think you've framed uh, in a really powerful way what Daisy has lived experience uh, of, which is uh, there's certain ways of working at the moment uh, at the policy level that doesn't bring in the insight for the field. What I'd like to do is uh, just bring a couple of other voices in. Uh, we could make them quite brief, and then I'll let the panel, we might be able to respond to some of them. Thanks very much. So we had one at the back here, and then if we could move over, to, over here, and then to the lady here. Hello. Okay. Um, I just want to ask a question about nice the bottom-up approach and creating professional learning communities. So how do you ensure that teachers can share their concerns in a safe space and not fear the hierarchy of being in an institution? Okay, thank you. I'm going to pick that up. We'll hear a few more. So uh, learning is going to come through failure, through talking about what we can't do yet. Uh, and then how do we create the psychological safety for that? Can I bring uh, the microphone down over here? We have the minister from Bhutan here. Thank you so much, minister, for being here. Um, comment here. And then we'll have one microphone over in this direction, please. Oh, thank minister, you. thank you for joining uh, thank us. Thank you. This session has been music to my ears as a teacher for so many years. Um, I couldn't agree more you know, with all that's been shared about the centrality of the teacher in this education stage. I believe among many others, teachers do two things. That is that they teach what they know. They know history, so they teach it. They mm. know biology, and they teach it. Mm. They know IT, and they teach it. So they teach what they know. But more importantly, they teach who they are. And uh, this is, I think, the more important uh, aspect of the teacher's um, mission. What they know can also be known by students on their own through the net, uh, through the other very many means that they have at their disposal. And it is also available in uh, so many other forms. What the teacher is, is not in the library, it is not on the net. The teacher is uh, a composite whole of uh, his or her own uh, upbringing, training, education, culture, civilization. The teacher is his beliefs or her beliefs, faith. The teacher is ideals and beliefs. beliefs. The teacher is the inheritor of um, the you. great tradition of um, knowledge and wisdom in his or her own field. And this is also passed on to succeeding generations of educators. So a teacher is, um, and a, a teacher does two things. Let me, uh, let me. And then I have to move on, Minister. One, one they, they teach what they know but more importantly, they teach who they are. And who they are is manifested by, not by saying, but by doing, by showing. And every single detail of the teacher's life is the curriculum for the children. Okay. So teachers do two things. They teach what they know, but more importantly, they teach who they are. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, what a great way to capture some of the discussion on transformation. And it seems to me that we're rediscovering that teachers are human. Uh, and that we need to invest in them as people. I'm going to bring a few more voices, and here's what I'm just going to beg your forgiveness, that we probably won't be able to answer all the questions, but the panel may well be available to then uh, speak to you afterwards. So I, I do want to serve those behind me. Did we have a microphone over here to this? To, where is the microphone? Oh. I, I am coming, so yes. I, we'll... Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, اسمي uh, uh, علي وهد uh, منسق لغة عربية في مدارس الوزارة uh, أنا سأتحدث باللغة العربية I speak in Arabic okay uh, طيب uh, My name is uh, Mr. Ali Wahd uh, Arabic coordinator uh, in uh, school uh, from ministry uh, there, is a, there is a big problem I think uh, uh, with uh, with the teacher that is um, a teacher uh, be afraid from um, um, upgrade if uh, he, uh, if he um, tell about himself okay. I need uh, to to uh, training and that means I didn't know so I I, I, I am afraid I maybe uh, next year I didn't hear because uh, I didn't know so um, he if if, he, if you ask him. What did you want? What do you want to to uh, training? I'm very good in everything. Okay. Okay. So we must uh, um, improve 
improvement the uh, the teacher uh, to to uh, uh, to go to the um, um, training himself and yeah very i think uh, a good connection is also to the yes. comment about another safety. i'm going to have to move on uh, to results, hear a few more results yeah, and there is a giant re between result and a teacher it's very problem so you must make big results in the, by the end of, year, of the year. I'm no? just going to come over to uh, this uh, <laughs> this bit over here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here, uh, do you want to, uh, I'm going to ask comments under 20 seconds. We've got about four minutes together here. So. Thank you very much. I'm Aisha. I'm from Africa. Wonderful to have you here. And, uh, you know, in the 1960s, before the 1960s, the teacher used to be the key person in a community. But then it has changed. Is it because of poverty or what? I don't know. Now the teacher is not valued, and yet we need to value the teacher. And also I enjoy the th th fact that you said the teacher has become a learner, mm -hmm. and he can learn a lot from his own students. And we also had found out in the 1990s that in Africa, the data was not uh, um, broken down into girls and men mm -hmm. and, 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 and uh, boys. And so this uh, importance of girls and women's education is key for development in the whole world. Thank you. Very well put. Thank you so much. So here's what we're going to do. Um, under 20 seconds, and I'm going to cut you off. So 20 seconds here, 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 and then in... A minute and a half, I'm going to come to each of you for any final thoughts on unlearning. Yes, sir. Okay, my name is Khalid Al-Hassan, and I work here at the Ministry of Education and Higher Education. But my interest, my work in higher education, what brought me here is dealing with my own children, okay? And from my observation, I know and I realize how critical, how dangerous is the role that is the teachers mm. they are playing in the school. I wish if I can hear from the panelists how we can promote what we call self-development or self-learning. And can we dream, basically, in a school without teachers or a school where the role of the teachers is reduced to the minimum, okay? Thank so, you. So, so basically, this is, this is the whole thing because, because it's a very critical issue about the teachers. Thank you so much, sir. And I think we're seeing this trend. If we're going to value teachers, then we have to value them by the way we set up these structures and cultures of learning. We've got some brief comments here. We have a microphone here, and then there'll be the last one, the, the lady here, and then we'll hear from the panel. I'm sorry we're a bit rushed. We're 15 minutes later in starting, so we're a bit uh, short Hello. Today. It was an amazing panel. I thought so, uh, too. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah. I mean, they are. <laughs> they have been an amazing panel. Yeah. Yes. Well said. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a researcher and an academic from Turkey with yes. a background in international education policies. So my question is about, I mean, if we can make a comparison between centralized education systems and decentralized, I just wonder, is there any case study or example from a highly centralized education system where teachers are still given autonomy or they have the room for coming up with a creative or innovative pedagogies or methodologies that they belong to the teachers. So if there is an example, I would like to hear from the panelists. Okay. Thank you so much. So I'm going to take that to the collective wisdom of the room. If you're aware of large scale systems that are quite centralized, who are empowering teachers with autonomy at scale. And your name is? Okay, please come and see here. So I'm being given the, uh, the call to wrap up. Uh, against my will, I could carry on this conversation for a very long time. Uh, last comments, uh, literally 10 seconds each. Anything on how do teachers need to, how do we need to unlearn how teachers learn? Last comments from the panel. So from my side, uh, I want to emphasize on the role of building trust, not only in schools, in workplace. This is related to leadership. Okay. And this won't happen in a day. It needs constructive feedback. It needs uh, a lot of interaction to make it possible. And I think that's very relevant to the comment about how do people feel safe to actually talk about these things. Just 10 seconds, unfortunately, for each. Um, I want to emphasize one, the role of culture building. Mm. 
culture build a mm. building a culture a democratic culture in the school a culture of caring most mm -hmm. importantly mm -hmm. a culture of valuing persons respecting persons respecting childhood respecting teachers and to your comment about uh, reducing the role of teachers i think what you mean is reducing the power of teachers mm. the role will still continue to be important but then it's the teacher is not the only resource but the children are resources as well and for policy makers quickly i think if you can improve you know they need to learn their lessons of democracy well so they should be in school as well well said last comments yeah, Daisy. building on the trust point what really helps me as a teacher is that uh, giving feedback that there's an environment of giving effective feedback I love Hattie and Timpoli and their study, um, but uh, that you that's, there's an opportunity to give feedback but also uh, feedback is given to me in an effective way. Okay, thank you. So the trust building process is often through that vulnerability and, and effective tr uh, feedback processes. Buthana, you have the last word. <laughs> the last word would be, I believe that the teaching profession is the most rewarding profession of all. You can see the results of your work immediately in the spark and sparkling eyes of your own students. Uh, in my view, to relearn and unlearn, uh, reflection is very important. The most effective teachers are reflective teachers. Well said. Well, we have been well served by these reflective practitioners. Can you please uh, give them another round of applause? I think what they've given us is uh, truly a tour de force of the research literature, practical examples, and the leadership that's going to uh, be required to unlearn how teachers learn. Thank you very much all for being here, and we look forward to carrying on the conversation for the rest of the conference.